So since that time, Colleen Johnston, who's our CFO, and many of you might know her, uh, she's been leading the charge on behalf of the organization. So she has a, a group of folks um, on her Women in Leadership Council. Uh, I'm a member of that group. Men and women across the organization. And really, it's our responsibility uh, to develop and to execute a plan to help women. So back in 2005, um, in order to formulate what are we going to do to make a difference this time around, a lot of research was undertaken. Um, you know, everything from a woman's standpoint, and frankly from the male and female standpoint of what our people managers need to do and how do we arm them to get better. Uh, things that were quite obvious to us, and frankly there was a lot of, I think, skepticism uh, that was shared with us at the time, and uh, a lot of barriers that still existed. And that really then helped us formulate a plan of what we needed to do. And so hence you quote some of the stats, but we have made great progress. We haven't declared victory. I don't know that we will uh, in the near term. <laughs> but we're always looking at stretching ourselves even further in terms of you know, setting some goals and making sure that we're you know, managing our programs and our initiatives to really make a, a meaningful impact uh, for the women that we're trying to serve. And you mentioned Colleen Johnson. How critical, as you look at it, and we're going to talk about this a little more with other examples as well, that it is someone that senior, that line-centric in the organization that takes ownership for it. Is that one of the shifts that you started to see where it is it's kind of moved out of the kind of a pocket exercise over here that someone's kind of got on their organizational development and it becomes core to the senior management team? I think it's absolutely critical because as I say, it sends a message and it sends a message that you're serious and frankly, there's accountability there. I think in the past it was women, you know, talking about women, um, and it became kind of a grassroots movement, which was effective in some, you know, in some way, but really didn't help us uh, get any traction or any real focus. So, um, so for all of our diversity leadership uh, initiatives, it is at the very senior level that the accountability is held, and then frankly, it gets delivered through the organization. So, you know, my boss who sits on also delivers then the mandate back to my business and to the rest of my peers, um, and I think that's important. And, and Jim, we're just talking about the role women play. Obviously, my question to you uh, certainly is: What role do men play in in, in women's advancement generally? Uh, especially your role, obviously, executive champion of the Women's Alliance within Xerox. Would love to understand, uh, as I said, the role men play. Some of the things that you've done at Xerox to make a cultural shift, and, and how and if that's impacted the fact that right now you have both in Canada and the U.S. Your most senior executive is a is a female and has been for a number of years now. Uh, well, we're, we're you know fortunate at Xerox in so far as diversity is uh, kind of cornerstone to the business. We had a founding uh, CEO who, back in the early '60s, uh, spoke eloquently about the need for ethnic and gender diversity inside the organization. How race or gender had really nothing to do with our job expectations, and we had led to affirmative action. Uh, we were the first out the door, primarily around uh, ensuring that African Americans had an opportunity to work for the organization, as Joe Wilson was worried about what was going on in the United States in the 60s, uh, a very socially conscious gentleman and a true visionary in this category. So it's there in the culture. Uh, we've had two iconic uh, leaders, Ed Mulcahy, who you may know because she was on the uh, P&G board for a while, and then uh, who ran the uh, global organization as chairman and CEO, uh, followed by Ursula Burns, the first handoff from one woman to another in an organization of our size globally. Uh, Ursula happens to be an African American, also a uh, very prominent and extremely talented person. Um, and I work for uh, a woman leader in Canada, Mike Schapansky, mm -hmm. incredibly effective leader also. So we have this advantage of very positive role models, etc. Uh, but the reality is we still have our own challenges. If you look at our work, uh, our, our managerial funnels, we still have major issues in key roles that are, if we don't fix these things, we will have you no know, women executives. Predictably, you can start seeing these problems. And, and a lot of it relates to job structure, and that is a man and woman problem. It is a business problem. We need to make sure that sales managers, which is important role inside the technology end of our business, that we've got women sales managers, because if we don't, we will never have women directors or senior leaders. But that job is structured to a large degree around schedules. So we expect them to be in the office at five o'clock. Well, for women with kids at home, and we have lots of single mothers, or for men with kids at home, 
uh, being in the office at 5 o'clock every day has almost been an impossibility. And if that's the only prospect, uh, and if you've got to abide by that schedule, we'll get people turning that job down, both men and women. So we need to change this in order to make sure that we've got, you know, a, a you know, better better structure for for diversity. In, in our organization, it's not a, uh, you know, you'd almost, you know, it, it is part of our culture, but the reality is you need to have real structure behind it to make it work. Everybody that's worked on this topic knows it is a lot easier to go 10 miles back on this topic than it is to go one inch forward. <laughs> and, um, and, and part of it is making sure your organization is structured to facilitate the great gains we've made by having the women leadership that we have. So that's the topic we work on, and that's something both men and women in this company work on. Okay, thank you. And then Sandy, building on that, if you could talk, you mentioned certainly that the Diversity Council has been put in place, the kinds of programs, because I think as I looked at a lot of it, uh, for all of, for, for Xerox and for TD, I was really taken by the scope of project. It's not one training course, it's not one mentor center where you can link up with someone. So sort of the degree of involvement that's required, the number of programs, and then also how are those measured? Because I think that often comes up as a topic too. How do we measure that? How do we make sure it's sustainable so that we don't get to a point where it's like, okay, check mark, we're done. And then to Jim's point, you're sliding back. Yeah, so there's a, there's, so for the women's initiative specifically, there's a number of kind of key um, components of what we do and they have evolved over time and I think they will continue to evolve as we as we move forward but so one is accountability so what gets measured gets done we all know that so we do establish benchmarks in each of our business segments of what um, of what the current state is and where we're aiming uh, to be so those uh, benchmarks become part of the scorecard frankly for all of our leaders uh, even at my business level so I know where I am today and what I'm aiming uh, in terms of uh, my diversity view if you will um, the second one, the really big component is kind of programs or initiatives that really did come from the women who told us, if you really want to make a difference, stick to these things and really make it um, available to us. And there's a couple of key things there. So mentorship is critically important. So women would say, I need to have the right role models, I need to have the right content, and I need people to help me. So we do have a very formalized group mentoring program where we identify women annually and put them into cross-business, cross-functional group mentoring. And we also have a very robust one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, program as well. The other one, uh, which is um, very obvious to all of you because you're here, is networking. So women will say, I need contact with the people who are in leadership positions. I need contact with the different opportunities available to me. So we do run a very robust networking program within the bank. We have 14 active chapters that are you know, broad business-based or functionally-based, if you will. And they do a couple of things, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face interactions uh, where we do invite and we get lots of executives that come out. It's almost like a mandated uh, presence, but I can tell you it's a great recruiting opportunity for all of us to meet women across the organization. <laughs> and we also um, have launched an online, um, if you will, or a virtual networking uh, capability. So early days for us, we're learning how to kind of leverage that to uh, the best of our ability, but we're getting better at that. That's kind of the building relationships. And then Lisa, you mentioned before, it's just capability. So we do have a very robust um, resource planning program, is what we call it in the bank. Uh, so for all of our uh, pre-management management employees and executives, we have uh, uh, what's called a personal development plan. Everyone completes a personal development plan. And through that, we get people's stated aspirations, uh, where their skill sets are today, and what we either as managers or they as employees feel are necessary for them to develop. And we share those quite broadly. So we can identify people very early in the pipeline in terms of their aspiration or capabilities, and we help maneuver them through the organization, whether it be through stretch assignments, through uh, cross-training, et cetera. So we do have a very robust uh, uh, process there. And then lastly, I'd say we go back and we measure continuously. Um, as you'd expect a bank to be, we're very analytical, and we like to measure, and we like to track and benchmark. So we have internal surveys that measure our um, our inclusiveness, our perception of inclusiveness, if you will, and then women's perceptions and feelings about how the organization is treating them. And we have annual benchmarks and, and touch points there so that we can measure our progress. That kind of, those four key components, I guess, is really the, the um, you know, the, the basis, I guess, of our women's uh, initiative. Great, thank you.
Um, and just a question on measuring as well. I know there, there's often a discussion around, you know, whether there needs to be sort of a set goal. Is it 30 percent? Is it 40 percent? Is it 50? Is it is it worked that stringently, or is it is it more? We know that we need to improve this year over year, and we're measuring that. Oh, no, it's not actual uh, numbers. So back in 2005, we were sitting at the BP plus level, about 22 percent representation. We set a goal of 35 percent for 2010. We achieved it. We set a goal for 38 percent for 2011, and fingers crossed we'll achieve it. Um, but I mean, the reality is the industry never changes, right? Your competitors are also seeking the same representation, so you are fighting against a very tough uh, industry and a very tough market. So we, I think, numbers are important. Um, and Lisa, just as you look, um, before we open it up to questions from the floor as well as some final thoughts, um, as you look just broadly at the trends across the industry um, in senior management and board placements, um, where are we at, what are you seeing, and what do you think we need to do to, to continue to move this forward? What can everyone do, both personally and within their organizations? So, so uh, there's some good news and bad news with us in terms of the snapshot of uh, today, uh, and on both sides of the border, and both at the senior executive level and at the board level. Uh, the great news is you're looking at, and these are, there are innovative organizations, uh, TD and Xerox, as I said, being, being uh, two of them. There are, there are many others. Uh, there are, are board, uh, chair, chairs of boards of directors and CEOs that are taking this initiative and making it not just core to uh, a mission statement, um, but core to their business strategy and achieving those results and making it clear from the top down that this is important to their organizations. That's a huge trend, and I would say in, even in the last five years, we're seeing a lot more of it. So with that comes, it, it, back to the business case, more regular just acceptance, especially if this matters. And, and then, of course, the very complex uh, programs uh, that get put in place and the metrics around it to make sure that it's there. So with that, there's more good news. What we're also seeing is there are, and, and there are real stats on this, there are more, more senior executives, women at the VP level, at the SVP level, at the EVP level, more that are on boards, et cetera. But, uh, if Travis was sitting in this room, and if anybody reads the paper, uh, another trend is fatigue, because they're not seeing enough movement fast enough. Not all organizations have quite the level of performance that, that the two that you're sitting here do. So there's, that hits into another component. I'm 42. I've been at this since I was 20. <laughs> uh, from my honors thesis uh, in, at school to, to what I'm doing now, there are many, many other talented people that are 50, 60, 70 that have been at this for a long time. And when I speak with them, they're quite frankly frustrated and exhausted. <laughs> so I, I share this with you um, and because I understand. They've been, they've been talking about it for a long time. They've seen some movement, but not enough. Uh, so I hear that. That's very valid. I mean, it's frustrating to be doing something for 20 or 30 years. Our job in the room, and I'm looking at just kind of the scope of the, the age range here, is to, the baton is being passed, to not let it drop, to, to go uh, out with enthusiasm, because there's much, much more work to be done. Work is happening. And I would say, you know, when there's frustration, for instance, if we read the globe, that there isn't a woman CEO of the banks yet. Well, the reality in the world is, you know, Barron's just did their top 30 CEOs in the world, and there wasn't a single woman CEO on that list. That is the world we're living in. But that doesn't mean to get overwhelmed and then say, well, then there's nothing we can do about it. It means, what do we have to do to make sure that there is a, a wealth of a plethora of very talented, capable uh, women that have been uh, trained? And that's where this, this um, getting this volume of uh, EVP, SVP, and, and talented people that are capable and connected on the board level um, and give, giving them opportunities to do that. So I would, I would say uh, the trends are, uh, positive in that there's real programs, there's real leaders, and there's real leadership at the top. I would say there's more to be done. I would say to the degree that there is a fatigue, there is a baton passing, and there's a whole bunch more of us that are coming up the ranks. And um, with that, then comes the responsibility and accountability to mentor and network and, and bring others in, in match. And why? Because it's the best business practices, it's the best thing for the company, it's how to engage and inspire the, the group that you have, it's how to have fun at work because people are valued for all of their talents, it's how to utilize your 50% of, of your resources. Um, I mean, there's so many reasons to do this, and uh, if anybody does get a bit tired, please call me, I will inspire you. <laughs> Put a little light under your fire. Uh, and I do that all the time. Um, so I, 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 think, I think there's a wide range of views on this issue, and they're all valid, um, and I would say there's more to be done. And the accountability goes out to you in the room to all take a, a role in this to really make it happen in your own organizations and companies. Great, thank you. 
Any final thoughts from any of you before I turn it over for questions from the audience, just on any of the topics we've discussed? I just keep pushing the, the same agenda. This is about the, the competitiveness of businesses. You look at large financial institutions. Uh, is there a competitive opportunity for a bank to stand up and say, we pledge to have a certain representation of women on our board within 10 years? It doesn't have to be a, a revolutionary objective, but is there the opportunity for a financial institution or another institution in a male-dominated industry uh, to gain share or more customers by saying, hey, we get it, we want the board to look like our customer base, both from an ethnic diversity point of view, especially in the city, uh, and a gender diversity point of view. And, and I think if we can create that competitive heat, uh, we add uh, we'll a level of momentum uh, to change here that uh, I think is important, and it, and it needs to happen because it is a fatiguing topic. If, to, you know, if, you know uh, a snail will crawl from here to British Columbia and back by the time you get 10% uh, representation on Canadian boards. It's, 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 it's pathetic how, it's really pathetic how the, <laughs> how the board thinks change. It's like, I think to that point though, what's interesting, and you do see a trend, whether in the firm you believe it or not, your customers are forcing you to think about it. I mean, we had our annual meeting uh, with Victoria, there was a gentleman that stood up and I'm going to say, or maybe early 70s, not to offend, I'm not sure how old he was, but he actually asked that question and said, when are things going to change and what are you doing about it? So I, I think that um, whether you as a firm get behind it or not, I think you will be forced to by virtue of the customers that you're serving because they're demanding it. Um, and so we as women of customers of many organizations can also demand things too, right? Yeah. Um, and I see it in the investor space. So women are highly underserved as it relates to helping them deal with their finances. So we, uh, although we do focus on women, we have now staked a claim and said we're going to have a specific strategy to address that because they demand it. Um, and why wouldn't we? Because it does make good business sense and frankly, that's who you're serving. So I, I do think that is shifting. I think the pressure now comes external, not just internal. Questions from the floor. Oh. <laughs> First of all, thank you. I'm one of the tired ones. <laughs> so you you agree at Thank you so much. Uh, I've been fighting this battle since I entered engineering school in the 70s, so I've been at it for a while. Um, my question really is to Lisa. Uh, when you are sourcing candidates for senior jobs, I'm sure it often comes down to a woman and a man. And I'll bet you that more often than not, the man gets chosen. Can you tell me what the intangible thing is that turns the key against the woman? Or do you, have you sort of thought through that? Well, actually, um, because I'm an advocate for this, that's, that's not actually what happens. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> um, and I ha I'm very proud of, um, and let me tell you how, how I do this. So when I'm working with selection committees on, on uh, a new CEO to be brought in, or selection committees meaning hiring, uh, they're hiring a VP or an EVP, the first part is uh, to build consensus that this is uh, um, this matters, and that this is going to be one of the factors that they'll be looking for. Um, and once you get that that approval, then the, and everybody's on the same page about it. So the first part of that is, is to have those discussions. Uh, Secondly, um, as I said, I have a, a, a record of putting top talent. Sometimes, I, um, you know, I believe in putting the best person in the role. So that is the best male and maybe the best female. Um, the, the, the reality is that once you raise the discussion and raise the bar to even have it, um, the choice often goes not not that way. Um, and because it's it's an additional, not the factor, but a factor uh, that matters, and the awareness is there. So. Uh, um, the results are really changing, and um, uh, truly, uh, just with the two CEOs for London Health Sciences Center and St. Joe's Hospital, one was a billion dollar organization, the other one was a half a billion dollar organization, it's the first time in history two women have <laughs> led those organizations, the two vice chairs that are now going to be the chairs are also women, never happened in Canadian history. Uh, so uh, I could give you a whole bunch of other examples of that, but it really has to do with raising the bar and then having access to top talent uh, in, with diverse backgrounds and because of my passion I meet a lot of talented people with multicultural backgrounds of, of different sorts, different genders, um, different uh, sexual orientations, etc. Uh, what I'm interested in is passionate, incredibly bright, talented people and understanding why they're the right organizational fit and right cultural fit for a particular role. 
but there, there is a there's a different. There's, I agree with you 100. percent There's also, I think, an issue for women who need to have the confidence to go for the role. A, a very interesting study. And I can't remember what it was, but I can look it up if you're interested. So they they looked at um, jobs posted, executive roles. There'd be 10 skill sets required. A woman would say, unless I add home 10. I can tick, 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 all the time, I won't apply. A man would say, I know five, I can learn the other five. Yeah. A generalization.